Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining. Um, on behalf of the Alimentive team, I want to welcome you to this live stream event um, around eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, my name is Chris Ma. I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Calgary in Canada, and uh, I'm the Senior Medical Director for Research and Development at Alimentive. Um, I think we've got a really exciting program for you this morning, and uh, we're uh, thrilled that you've joined us. Um, I've just got a couple of housekeeping notes before I hand over to our moderator. Um, so uh, if you experience any technical issues during the program, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to use the question area. That's on the right hand side of your screen. Someone will respond to you immediately. Um, be sure to unmute uh, your video to hear the sound um, and uh, to click on the viewing screen for the unmute option. Uh, for optimal viewing, we suggest that you try to close uh, any other programs or windows that are running on your device. Uh, at the end, we will be having a question and answer session with all of the panelists. Um, if you'd like to submit a question, we'd uh, encourage you to do so again on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a, a question and answer area. Um, we may not be able to get to all of the questions during the session, but uh, if there are any unanswered questions, we certainly will respond to them offline. Um, so uh, we will uh, ensure we get to all of the, the comments and questions. And then uh, finally, uh, if you are experiencing any issues viewing the main screen, uh, there is a stream option number two at the bottom, so uh, please don't hesitate to use that if, uh, if you're having any challenges. Uh, so with those out of the way, it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today. Uh, he's someone that really doesn't need any introduction, but uh, Dr. Arian Brednard is a professor of uh, neurogastroenterology and motility at University of Amsterdam, a consultant gastroenterologist at AMC, and, and really one of the world's leaders in eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, he's the president of the European Society of uh, Eosinophilic Esophagitis, and he's been a tremendous collaborator with our group. So uh, with that, I'll uh, hand uh, the microphone over to Arian. Uh, Arian, thank you very much for moderating today. Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone again to this exciting webcast on eosinophilic esophagitis. This is one of the most dynamic fields in the gastroenterology at the moment, both in terms of basic research and advancement of new pharmacological treatments. And uh, most of what we know of EOE today has been discovered in the past five to 10 years. And I'm a very grateful for the academic collaboration with Elementive if we made the difference on several topics. We have three top speakers for today. In the next 60 minutes, they will inform you of the latest insights in the field. And the first speaker is Dr. Evan Dellen, and he's a professor of medicine and adjunct professor of epidemiology at the um, University of North Carolina School of Medicine in Chapel Hill in the USA. Um, He's also the director of the UNC Center for Esophageal Diseases and Swallowing. And his main research interest is, of course, eosinophilic esophagitis. He performs research in epidemiology, pathogenesis, diagnosis, treatment, and outcomes of EOE and also other eosinophilic GI diseases. And uh, he has contributed uh, a lot um, more than anyone else in the, in the past uh, 10 years. He's truly one of the giants in the fields. And today, uh, Dr. Dellen will inform us on the future targets for drug development in EOE. Thank you very much, Ariane, for that uh, kind introduction. It's great to be here um, and to present today on uh, future targets for drug development in EOE. I do have some disclosures that are on this slide here that you can see. And what I'd want to, what I'd like to do over the next um, uh, 10 or 15 minutes is to review the treatment landscape in EOE, so everyone's oriented about the current treatment options, and briefly discuss the management algorithm uh, for EOE with a highlight on some recent guidelines that have just been published, and then spend most of the time reviewing some of the emerging treatment modalities for EOE. We'll talk about biologics and some novel agents on the horizon, as well as some future targets. So the EOE treatment landscape 
has been fairly bare uh, over the, the past uh, 20, 30 years. But I would say, uh, as was just mentioned, in the last 10 years, we're starting to get a lot of options. And when we think about treatments, we have the non-pharmacologic options on one hand, dietary elimination um, being the primary uh, anti-inflammatory non-pharmacologic option and esophageal dilation, of course, when there are strictures and symptoms of dysphagia. And then on the other side, you have your pharmacologic treatments, uh, which can include proton pump inhibitors, uh, typically swallowed or topical corticosteroids, and then um, a number of other uh, possibilities. I'm not going to spend time really on the steroids or on some of these other agents, but really focus on the novel um, uh, and developing treatments for today. I would point out that at least here in the U.S., there are still no FDA-approved medications for EOE, um, but in Europe and Canada, there is one approved medication. And so um, we're starting to see uh, these come through the regulatory um, authorities and be available for patients as well. Uh, just to point out that there are published uh, treatment guidelines from the American Gastroenterological Association, the Joint Task Force on Allergy Immunology from last year. And these are detailed um, evidence-based guidelines as well as a technical review. And so I have these up here for your reference if you wanna look at some of the data behind the treatments such as the PPIs, dietary elimination or steroids. When we think about EOE overall, once we have our diagnosis of EOE, we think about esophageal strictures, whether they need to be dilated. And then we have basically the first line agents. These would be proton pump inhibitors, topical steroids, or dietary elimination. And the choice is really made in a shared decision framework model, talking to the patients about which one they prefer. We don't yet have any comparative efficacy data, but if you treat somebody with one of these three options and they respond, um, you'll monitor them. The vast majority of people deem maintenance therapy and ongoing monitoring in this chronic disease. If they don't respond, the recommendation is to switch between the first line treatments, um, and hopefully then you'll have an adequate response and can go down the right-hand um, side of this algorithm. Um, but again, if you do this and there's still an inadequate response, then there is a difficulty because you have a very refractory patient, and what can you do? Well, you can dilate them to help with their symptoms if there's a stricture. You can make sure there's not a complication, an infection, or some non-EOE cause, or you could consider other agents or potentially clinical trials. And it's here where we may see some of these novel agents first starting to play a role. So um, as I already mentioned, in the last five or 10 years, we've learned a tremendous amount about the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of EOE. And this schematic takes you through it where we have uh, food antigens primarily interacting with uh, an esophageal lining where there's an epithelial defect. And this starts this cascade of Th2 inflammatory or allergic inflammation that ultimately leads to recruitment of eosinophils, mast cells, and then leads to the clinical symptoms of of, uh, that we see in patients, as well as ongoing loss of barrier function and remodeling of the esophagus. And the main reason I put this up is because now at almost every one of these arrows, you can see that there's a potential therapeutic agent um, that can be targeting some part of this pathogenesis. And in the orangish color, those are all biologics. And in the black color are small molecules. And um, and not all of these have been um, necessarily tested or published, but there's rationale for, for all of these. And so if we think about the potential targets in EOE, on the left here, you see published trials, and I'm gonna go, uh, sorry, on the, on the left, you see no published trials, but we'll talk about potentially some of the rationale of these medications. And on the right, you see the published trials, and I'm gonna take you on a relatively quick tour through these data and let you know how these targets are working and how these medications look. So first of all, the, the anti-IL-5 medications. The rationale is that IL-5 is a central cytokine in EOE pathogenesis. It is involved with eosinophil maturation and development and activation. And so the thought is if you block IL-5, you may have a very good treatment outcome. And as you can see here, there's been three randomized trials. These are getting to be about 10 years old now, a small one in adults and two larger ones in children on the two right side. And in general, pre-treatment compared to post-treatment, you can see a very nice response in decreasing the eosinophils with these agents. Now, these uh, have not been um, extensively pursued since then because there were some issues with how symptoms were monitored in the trials. Um, but now there is one investigator-initiated study in adults that's ongoing, looking to see if this may be effective using uh, more modern validated symptom metrics. 
Um, so keep an eye out. In the US, at least, this medication is approved for um, eosinophilic asthma and hyper eosinophilic syndrome, but not for EOE. And in fact, none of the medications I'm going to talk about now uh, are approved for EOE. The second one that I'll talk about is an anti IL 13 medicine, uh, formerly called RPC 4046, uh, now renamed Sindacamab. This is an anti IL 13 medication. And why target IL-13? Again, this is a central TH2 cytokine in the EOE pathway. Um, this is highly upregulated, and IL-13 itself leads to much of the pro-inflammatory uh, changes that we see in, in EOE. So this was a phase two um, randomized control trial. It enrolled 99 subjects and randomized them to either a high dose or a low dose of this medication or to placebo. And 90 of these patients completed the study. In the top left panel, you see the primary outcome, which is the mean esophageal eosinophil count. In the light gray color, there are um, there's that's the placebo. And before and after treatment, there's no change in the eosinophil count. The middle set of bars uh, are, is the low dose and the right set of bars is the high dose. And in both of those, you can see a marked and significant decrease in esophageal eosinophilia with this treatment. The top right graph shows the histologic response um, at thresholds of less than or equal to six and less than 15 EOS per high power field. Um, placebo, no histologic responders. If we look at less than 15 EOS per high power field, about 50% in each of the dose groups. And then the panel on the bottom left shows the decrease in symptoms. Here you can see a larger decrease in symptoms of dysphagia in the high dose compared to the low dose or the placebo group. And the final panel bottom right shows the endoscopic outcomes. No real change in endoscopic severity with the placebo, but a marked and decreased um, endoscopic severity with both of the other doses. And you'll hear in, in the uh, following talks about why some of these outcomes are chosen, what the background is there. Um, so interestingly, this in this study, about half of the patients were steroid refractory and sort of fall into that um, non-responsive group I showed you in the algorithm. And there were similarly good responses in that group. It was generally well tolerated. And there was a maintenance study for up to 52 weeks where 86% of the subjects entered and about 66 completed the open label extension. And the main point here is that once you have a response to this medication, that response persists over the 52 week open label extension. And more than that, the placebo group where the patients were previously treated in placebo, that's the blue line. You see that that comes down to the red and yellow lines on these graphs, which were the active arms, and then everybody maintained their response. Now of note, everybody in the open label extension here were at the higher doses. The next one I'd like to talk about is anti-IL-4R. This is dupilumab. This is a medication in the US that's approved for asthma, atopic dermatitis, and chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. This was a phase two study, um, uh, proof of concept of 47 patients. Here, the primary outcome in that top left panel was symptoms of dysphagia, and you see a significantly um, higher decrease in symptoms of dysphagia in the purple active arm with dupilumab compared to the pink in placebo. Um, the uh, middle graph there shows the change in the eosinophil counts, and you see a marked decrease in the active arm with about an 80% histologic response for less than 15 EOs. We also saw significantly significant improvements in endoscopic findings and in esophageal distensibility with this. Um, this is now in phase three studies, and these are the preliminary results from the phase three um, study, which is, which is an approval study. And here in orange active treatment compared to the placebo, on the left, you see the histologic outcome, uh, excellent response compared to placebo. And on the right, you see a decrease in dysphagia symptoms, again, significant compared to placebo. So very promising. Um, you can see with the secondary outcomes here, also a decrease in endoscopic severity and a decrease, not just in the eosinophil count, but in the overall histologic severity measured by the EOE histologic severity. Severity score. Again, we'll hear a little bit more about this um, later. So this, we're waiting to hear what the results look like as this phase three study is completed. Next, we can talk about benralizumab, which is an anti-IL-5 receptor antagonist. This medication, when it activates the IL-5 receptor, causes um, eosinophil depletion. And this was actually a study not in EOE, in, uh, EOE, but it was in a study with patients with hyper eosinophilic syndrome, a proportion of whom had 
uh, GI involvement, essentially eosinophilic gastritis or enteritis. And uh, the point here is it gives proof of principle that uh, the patients who had GI involvement with eosinophils at baseline in that red box, very high eosinophil counts were treated with this medication and it caused tissue depletion of the eosinophils seen in that green box after treatment. So this is a promising agent and it's actually um, under study in a phase three trial for EOE. Um, and we'll be starting up trials for um, non-EOE EGs as well. Finally, anti-siglic 8. This is a receptor located on eosinophils and mast cells. It's an inhibitory receptor. So when this antibody, AK002, now called larentilumab, activates the receptor, it causes eosinophil depletion and mast cell deactivation. And so it's targeting the effector cells. And this was a phase two uh, study for eosinophilic gastritis and or duodenitis, where it showed um, great proof of concept compared to placebo. For the primary endpoint in the top row, you can see marked eosinophil depletion between 79 and 92% of eosinophils in the stomach or small bowel compared to an increase in placebo. Um, and this study, this MED is now in phase three studies for these um, non-EOE EGID conditions. But in that per protocol analysis, you can see a proportion of patients also had esophageal involvement. And in these patients, the medication also caused eosinophil depletion in the esophagus and improvements in symptoms of dysphagia. So this is also in a phase two slash three study for EOE. So in addition to those that have all been um, tested and results are available. Um, other factors within that EOE pathway that I, I showed you include TSLP, which is sort of, it's a cytokine that you can think of as a master allergy regulator. A medicine called tezepelumab has been assessed in asthma, including in a phase three study that was just published and theoretically could be applied to EOE. There's proof of concept with a uh, targeting the IL-15 cytokine. There are some proof of concept case reports looking at um, the alpha-4 beta-7 uh, anti-integrin like vetalizumab, which is approved for IBD. And most recently, a small molecule, a sphingosine 1-phosphate or S1P receptor modulator. This is a focus modulator, the 145 receptor subtypes called atrazumab. Um, this is uh, has strong proof of concept and a phase two trial has just started. This medication is thought to impact lymphocyte tracking to the esophagus and so may work at the top of the um, pathogenic pathway rather than at the bottom at the and the effector cells. So with that background, where could a novel um, therapeutic fit within EOE? Well, this is the treatment algorithm that I showed you before. And certainly um, right up front, you think about people who are refractory to the initial treatment. Certainly these medications would be appropriate for those patients if they are shown to work. But you could think they could be um, applied to PPI non-responders potentially, um, perhaps as first line treatment perhaps as maintenance therapy, and perhaps if some have an antifibrotic component um, to patients with EOE and fibrostenosis. So where these actually will fit in ultimately will of course depend on efficacy, mechanism, and safety in their, in their profiles. Finally, just a word about, uh, about personal, personalization for biologics. Of course, we have no comparative efficacy data yet, and it'll be a long time probably since any of that comes in. But we do know that one EOE patient is not the same as the other. And in fact, there's a um, heterogeneity of the types of cytokines within patients. And this is research from the Seeger group um, led by uh, Julia Dunn out of Cincinnati, where it shows that within certain patients, there are different cytokine levels. So for example, there's some people who are IL-5 low and perhaps TSLP high or IL-13 high and IL-5 low or IL-5 high and other cytokines low. And this may give us some way to think about personalizing and targeting these biologics in the future. And so I would imagine sometimes when we think about EOE diagnosis, instead of essentially choosing a therapy based on our preferences and patient preferences, we have a data-driven way and a physiologic-driven way um, to uh, identify the treatments that are best. So we might look at predictors of treatment response or phenotype assessments to figure out which type of medications would be best for these patients. So in summary, um, the current EOE management um, positions PPIs, topical steroids, and dietary elimination as first-line options, and we're using the shared decision-making framework to choose this. Um, but a number of novel treatments are on the horizon. There's an incredibly um, high level of activity assessing biologics and small molecules in EOE, but the place in the treatment algorithm for these novel agents has yet to be determined. But it is an exciting time for EOE therapeutics, novel mechanisms, and multiple trials underway. 
So thank you very much for uh, speaking. I would like to put in um, one shameless plug for EgidPartners.org. This is um, a global patient registry of patients with EGIDs and non egid controls where we're trying to do patient-focused research. So please do ask your patients to check it out. Uh, thank you again for letting me speak and I'll look forward to the Q&A period. Thank you so much for that excellent overview, Evan. Uh, it's really hopeful that so many new options may become available for our patients in the not so near and not so distant future. We'll uh, go to our next speaker, Dr. Katja Zafraniva. And uh, Dr. Zafraniva is a senior researcher at the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine, University of Bern in Switzerland. And her main research objective is to study outcome assessment in eosinophilic esophagitis. She has been uh, closely involved in about all the work that has been done in this uh, field in EOE. She has um, coordinated a team of international collaborators to develop the um, EOE Activity Index, um, the ESI, which has been used in various uh, phase two and phase three studies and uh, published extensively on patient perspective and therapy goals. And together with clinicians um, of Seeger, the European Society of EOE, the Urials and Elementive, she was key in creating the EOE core outcome set, which just have been published. Katja is regarded a global expert um, in outcome research, and it is really a pleasure to announce the title of her lecture, The Patient Reported Outcomes in EOE. Thank you, Dr. Bradnard, for this kind introduction, and to Adimantiv for invitation to give this presentation. In the interest of time, I will focus on patient reported symptoms in adults with eosinophilic esophagitis. Here are my disclosures. Patient reported outcomes Patient reported outcomes are defined as any report of status of patient's health condition that comes directly from the patient. There are measures and instruments we use to assess patient reported outcomes. In clinical trials, these tools measure the effect of medical interventions on the concepts related to patient's health status, such as a group of EOE symptoms we typically assess. In conceptual framework, we must still Think of domains measuring disease activity. We can subdivide those into clinician and patient reported outcomes. And so today we're going to focus on symptoms. Symptoms of esophageal dysfunction are one of the diagnostic pillars of this condition. Although we continue to improve assessment of biologic findings and our PRO instruments, it is likely that only part of the variation of symptom severity will be explained by biologic findings as main symptom of this condition dysphagia is easily modified by various patient behaviors that we are unlikely to capture in their entirety during clinical trials. Therefore, in the draft guidance, US FDA recommended that assessment of efficacy should include drugs effects on both symptoms and inflammation of co-primary endpoints and that you saw throughout Evan's presentation. Domains of UE related symptoms are centered around its main symptom, dysphagia. Patients frequently describe various foods that cause dysphagia, they use various strategies to avoid as well as to deal with dysphagia episodes. Patients experience swallowing and non swallowing associated pain. In English, patients use the language food being stuck, tightening of the esophagus, delayed passage of food and trouble swallowing most frequently to describe the dysphagia symptoms. The symptom that is not on this slide is feeling of the food going down. Patients often overlook these symptoms and think it is something that also occurs in persons without EOE. Patients use strategies to avoid dysphagia episodes, such as avoiding foods of certain consistencies, preemptively drinking liquids, processing of the foods, such as cutting foods into small pieces, as well as carefully or slowly eating a meal. Strategies dealing with dysphagia are also numerous. Besides simply waiting, patients, among others, drink liquids to try to dislodge blocked foods, try to get the food back out, and seek medical attention for the endoscopic disimpaction. In 2017, Dr. Bradnord and the Lementiv team published this excellent systematic review of various EOE indices used in studies. On your left, 
you can see multitude of symptom-based instruments used in studies. And on your right, criteria that we use to assess the validity of the PRO instruments. I will go over the content validity, criterion validity, and responsiveness of the PRO measures currently used in clinical trials of adults. Instruments used in RCTs include dysphagia symptom questionnaire and dysphagia symptom diary used in RPC 4046 program. That instrument is conceptually very similar to DSQ. Episode-based PRO symptom of EOE pros used in APT 1011 program. Numeric rating scales for severity of dysphagia and pain during swallowing used in your VASA program and symptom-based eosinophilic esophagitis activity index that was used in multiple programs and was developed in collaboration by Swiss and US researchers. This excerpt from qualitative analysis conducted in adults participating in ESI study is meant to illustrate that various PRO instruments use different language to describe dysphagia. DSQ uses impaction and foods passing slowly, whereas ESI and NRS use difficulty swallowing. Wording like tightening of the esophagus described by many OE patients participating in the qualitative studies for ESI and DSQ development has not been used to describe dysphagia in any instrument that I know. PS de resistance of most PRO instruments is dysphagia frequency. DSQ and DSD assess dysphagia daily over 14 day period. NRS for dysphagia exists as 24 hour recall version and captures dysphagia frequency over seven day period. ESI assesses dysphagia frequency with a seven day recall. The notable exception is PROSE instrument that assesses episodes of dysphagia on daily basis. These PRO instruments capture different symptom domains in addition to dysphagia frequency. For example, ESI queries foods causing dysphagia, strategies avoiding dysphagia, and swallowing associated pain. Swallowing associated pain is also assessed by an arrest for pain, pros, and even occasionally by DSQ and DSD users. DSQ also assesses strategies of dealing with dysphagia episodes. In conclusion, nearly all the instruments assess dysphagia frequency, but they use different language to describe dysphagia and query different symptom domains. This heterogeneity undoubtedly complicates the comparison between therapies. As these instruments are content valid, they are responsive to change following treatment. For example, placebo run, following placebo run-in, dysphagia symptom questionnaire could differentiate between symptom severity in budesonide oral suspension and placebo-treated patients. This difference was small, but statistically significant, and Dr. Dallin also showed the dupilumab data. DSD and ESI might also be responsive, and we've seen some iteration of this slide in Dr. Dallin's presentation. Both instruments were used in RPC 4046, ESI and DSD. Although the difference in symptom severity between placebo and drug-treated patients did not reach statistical significance in this study. It was not powered for symptom severity and there was no placebo run in. In addition to various to changes in various scores, we use another PRO based endpoint, dysphagia free days. Following a six week treatment with budesonide or a dispersible tablet, patients gained extra three dysphagia free days compared to those treated with placebo. Dysphagia free day was defined as a day with no, only minimal dysphagia of less than two points on 10 point in arrest for dysphagia. I like this endpoint. It's easy to understand. And especially, and I think we are especially lucky that we can explain this endpoint relatively easily to our patients. They also use clinical remission as PRO based endpoint. You can see that following six week induction treatment with budesonide or a dispersible tablet, more than 50% of patients were in clinical remission defined as ESI score of less than equal to 20. If I interpreted the statement of the US FDA drive guidance correctly, the US regulators accept only complete resolution of symptoms as remission definition. They are back to differ. In inflammatory bowel disease, remission definition allows for some residual disease activity 
And we could probably accept a certain type of dysphagia events as clinical remission, because aiming for no dysphagia events, even mild ones following short treatment, might be very ambitious target for our therapies. And so let's talk now briefly about criterion validity. We as a community for a while had difficulties consistently show that symptoms are associated with biologic findings. Hence, this statement from European EOE guidelines. Among others, it is based on the kind of results you see here. ESIPRO assessed symptoms were not accurate in identifying patients in biologic remission, this area under the curve of 0.6. And so we continue to look for this elus elusive criterion validity. Recently, Dr. Dallin and his team compared the efficacy of fluticasone and bodesonide in randomized controlled study. Both drugs improved endoscopic and histologic appearance, as well as symptoms assessed by DSQ and ESI. When we examined the relationship between base, baseline esophageal eosinophilia and PRO scores of patients enrolled into that trial, we observed positive, moderate association between these parameters in never dilated patients and no association in patients that were dilated prior to study baseline. Therefore, dilation modifies the association between symptoms and eosinophilia and that's true, not only for baseline data, but also for changes from baseline to end of treatment. As confirmation in this recent Seeger study, we observed negative association between ESI and eosinophilia in a group of patients dilated within one year of endoscopy, that's green line, positive moderate association between these parameters in never dilated patients, that's red line, and no association in patients dilated more than one year prior to endoscopy, and that's your blue line. In that group, median time from dilation to endoscopy was 3.5 years. Therefore, in dilated patients, it looks like it takes more than one year for the relationship between eosinophilia and symptoms to recover to the strengths of the association seen in never dilated patients. With that, I reached my concluding slides. I hope I was able to convince you that PRO measures used in RCTs of adults with EOE utilize different language to describe dysphagia and assess different symptom domains. Perhaps we should tease out which domain, in addition to dysphagia frequency, might be useful to assess in the context of induction and maintenance studies. The use of many PRO instruments in trials of adults complicates the comparison of the results of different studies. In recent international careers exercise that Arian mentioned, EOE researchers agreed on minimal set of outcomes that should be assessed in all our cities, precisely to tackle that heterogeneity. Careers experts recommended to use DSQ in all our cities. ESI, seven-day version, was also recommended as a second-line instrument to facilitate cross-comparison between trials. Both instruments are proprietary, and historically, many programs developed their own instruments that they will continue to, to use. So careers recommendations are to be taken with a grain of salt. Drop-in symptom score, remission definitions, and dysphagia-free days are used as PRO-based endpoints. Having discussion around remission definition is important given that US FDA draft guidance currently advocates for complete resolution of symptoms. For purposes of RCTs, you should collect information on dilation status going a few years back as dilation modifies association between eosinophilia and symptoms. This would also allow us to use eosinophilia for anchor-based methods and that would facilitate comparisons between therapies. With that, I would like to finish and I thank you all for your attention and I look forward to the discussion at the end of this session. Yes, yes. thank you. Yes, thank you, Katja. This was uh, perfect. Um, and um, I also look forward to seeing you back in the panel discussion later. And uh, we'll proceed to our final speaker, Dr. Chris Ma. 
and uh, Dr. Maas, an academic gastroenterologist and assistant professor of medicine and community health sciences at the University of Calgary in Canada. And he's also the senior medical director for the research and development group at Elementiv. His primary clinical and research interests are in clinical trial design and methods for inflammatory disorders of the GI tract, such as um, IBD and, of course, EOE. And uh, Chris and Katja run the EOE core outcome project together. And this has been a huge um, project, um, coordinating dozens of expert clinicians and scientists globally. And the project will make comparisons of outcome of intervention studies much easier in the future. And it uh, meant a huge step forward for the field. And I uh, really enjoyed working with Chris on the project and other projects. And um, I look forward to his, uh, to his lecture. Is your patient better measuring response to treatment, endoscopy, and histopathology? All right. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, much appreciated. So uh, it's always difficult to give a talk after Katja and Evan, um, but I'll try to bring us home in the next uh, 10 to 12 minutes here. So um, we're gonna really look at uh, endoscopic and histologic measures of disease activity in this uh, talk. One of the pillars of our R&D group is developing outcome measures that are robust and can be used in clinical trials. And uh, endoscopy, and histology are, are really key to the EOE assessment. Um, to start with some background, uh, this is a slide you've already seen before, um, but I thought it was worth repeating. Um, and really it's the question around why do we need to use these objective measures in addition to patient symptoms? And as Katja nicely outlined, really the symptoms are only modestly at best correlated with um, with both histologic and endoscopic response and remission. And clinically that poses a challenge because if you think about the progressive course of patients with EOE to developing fibrostenotic complications, the challenge with treating patients to symptomatic remission alone means that there is a potential gap where patients can have silent inflammation that progresses over time. In the clinical trial space, it also poses a number of challenges when we're thinking about symptom-based endpoints as uh, Katja nicely uh, outlined. So um, on the left here is a box and whisker plot from a meta-analysis of all EOERCTs. And you can see that when you use histologic and endoscopic measures, the placebo rate essentially goes almost to zero. Whereas there's about a 20, 25% difference when we're using symptom-based measures. And, and that has a couple of risks. One obviously is that it reduces the efficiency of trials when you're trying to compare against outcomes that don't have a very low placebo response. And then two, which we've certainly experienced in IBD and in, in some of the historical uh, EOE trials that Evan mentioned, um, it risks, you, you risk the delta in terms of the treatment difference with an active comparator. Um, Katja has nicely outlined that the regulatory guidance really for phase three trials in EOE um, recommends both the co-primary endpoint of uh, signs and symptoms related to the disease as well as histologic response um, based on the peak eosinophil count. Um, when we think about um, the operating properties of a disease activity measure that we, we want to see um, obviously, these measures need to be valid, um, and Katja outlined the different components of validity. But in addition to that, these indices need to be reliable. So um, between one reader and another, they need to be able to assess the same thing. And even within the same reader, uh, they need to be able to evaluate um, the same components. We want these indices to be responsive to change and responsive to therapies of known efficacy so that uh, before and after treatment, you can identify a therapeutic difference. And of course, these um, tools need to be feasible. They need to be able to be uh, measured in a practical way. So um, what do we use now for histology and endoscopy? So um, from a histology perspective, um, you've seen a lot of data around the peak eosinophil count. And I think there's some advantages to the peak uh, eosinophil count. It's a clini clinically very meaningful number. Um, I think all of us use it in our day-to-day -day practice. It's uh, used in diagnosis and it's relatively simple to interpret. But 
the PKSNFL count doesn't uh, account for the extent or the severity of other histologic features of EOE. Um, the thresholds that have been used to define response and remission historically have been variable. And of course, it's sensitive to the microscope uh, field size and sampling adequacy. And then finally, which I think speaks to Evan's point that he made is that, you know, we have all of these novel mechanisms of action. The peak eosinophil count may not be responsive to therapies that are not directly targeting eosinophils. And Evan showed you a number of those uh, compounds that are in, in development. For endoscopy, um, the endoscopic reference score that was developed by Iko Hirano and colleagues um, is really the, the main measure that is uh, being used. Um, it's a, again, clinically relevant score. I think uh, the features uh, really are, are things that we see in patients with EOE. It's easy to learn and reliable to score. But the EREFs was developed as a classification tool to describe the endoscopic features rather than uh, formally developed as a disease activity index. And one of the things that we've certainly learned from the IBD experience is that when the when endoscopy is used at the site level for clinical trial, it does introduce the potential for local reading bias because the site personnel are not blinded to the time point in the study. Uh, there's different methods of scoring the EREFs that have been proposed, and there's different thresholds for responsiveness and for individual items that require additional evaluation. So um, in the next few slides, I want to just go over some of the index development work that we've done in this field, starting with histology. Um, Evan had mentioned earlier this tool called the EOEHSS, which was developed by uh, Margaret Collins and colleagues. Um, and this addresses some of the limitations that I uh, brought up around the peak eosinophil count. So you can see this is a tool that includes multiple components of histologic activity. So you can see that there's eight different component items that are assessed there um, and component items that are uh, in addition to eosinophilic uh, burden. And secondly, um, the score assesses not only the grade or the intensity of the, the severity of the findings, but also the stage or the extent of the findings within the biopsies. And so um, this really is more in line with some of the other uh, histology tools that are used in, in other GI conditions. Um, we uh, evaluated the reliability of this tool. Um, so this is a project that was done where we looked at 45 um, patients with EOE and their pathology specimens. They were read multiple times in random order by four blinded pathologists. And we looked at both the intra-rater ICC, so within the same pathologist, as well as the inter-rater ICC among different pathologists. And along the y-axis here is the intra-class correlation coefficient, which is a measure of their agreement. Um, these are the benchmarks for interpreting these results. So uh, ICCs that are above 0.8 reflect almost perfect agreement. ICCs that are above 0.6 uh, substantial agreement. And really we wanna see these numbers above 0.6 for purposes of uh, using the instrument in trials. And you can see both the intra and inter-rater ICCs for uh, the grade and stage score are very high. Uh, this is it broken down by uh, individual components. And so again, here, uh, it's a bit of a busy slide, but you can see that uh, for the most part, most of these items are very reliably assessed. There certainly are some items uh, like, for example, dyskeratotic epithelial cells that um, have lower reliability, but overall as a tool, uh, it's, a very, it's very reliably assessed among uh, expert pathologists. We then looked at this uh, tool for assessing response. And I think in many ways, this is um, potentially the most important component in, in clinical trial evaluation because you do want a tool that is going to differentiate your uh, active therapy against the comparator. So here uh, we took uh, 40 paired biopsy samples from patients uh, before and after treatment with the three sort of mainstay therapies at this time. So um, swallowed topical corticosteroids, uh, PPIs, um, or dietary elimination. And we compared the peak eosinophil count to the EOEHSS. And you can see that um, numerically uh, the 
both the stage and grade of the EOEHSS um, were extremely responsive. Um, the dotted line on this slide shows a large effect size. So um, certainly within the IBD space, we wish we could have effect sizes that look like this, but really very responsive to treatment. And additionally, we looked at a global measure of the inflammatory burden on a visual analog scale in uh, the EOEHSS stage and grade were uh, strongly correlated with the overall change in, in inflammatory activity. So uh, in terms of takeaways for histology, I think the peak eosinophil count, it's an important measure of disease activity, but certainly has some limitations. The EOEHSS is reliable and responsive to treatment, and it does capture components of activity that are not evaluated by the peak eosinophils alone. Um, and uh, we think this should be incorporated as a measure used in EOERCTs, as I'll discuss when we talk about choreos. Um, a few words about endoscopy measures. So uh, this is the EREF score that was developed by Dr. Hirano. Again, um, these are sort of the pivotal features. Um, this is esophageal rings. Um, you can see exudates uh, endoscopically, uh, linear furrows or vertical lines, uh, and then uh, presence of edema or, or, ab or blurring of the vascularity. Um, we thought that the EREFs was really, uh, it had really permeated the space in terms of both use in clinical trials as well as, I think, increasingly used in clinical practice. But there were a number of uh, questions around the EREFs that uh, I think needed to be clarified. And so what we did was we um, organized a modified RAND UCLA appropriateness panel with uh, international EOE experts. And we went through a number of different components related to the EREFs. So how are individual endoscopic items defined? What's the language used for them? What's the grading for different items? How should it be assessed? How should the score be evaluated. Um, in using those recommendations, um, we embarked on, again, another reliability and responsiveness study to assess the properties of the EREFs and different ways of scoring the EREFs to provide some clarity. So um, here we took uh, 40 patients with EOE, again, before and after treatment with sort of the pivotal or sort of the current mainstays of therapy for EOE. They had uh, endoscopy videos done before and after eight weeks of therapy, which were assessed by two blinded uh, central readers who uh, assessed the videos in random order multiple times, again, to evaluate some of these operating properties. Um, we looked at a number of different modifications to the EREFs, uh, and each of these modifications had some different hypotheses around them. So um, in addition to the original EREFs, we looked at a simplified version of the score where we just everything was categorized as either absent or present, with the hypothesis being that this would be potentially more reliably scored because it's a simpler version of the, of the index, as well as a fully expanded version of the EREFs, which has a more dynamic range going from zero to 11. And here you can see almost all of the categories are expanded to grades zero, one, two, or potentially three. And again, the hypothesis around this was that with a more dynamic range, you would see more responsiveness. Um, when we looked at uh, intra and inter-rater reliability, again, um, you can see that um, there was uh, substantial to almost perfect uh, inter and intra-rater reliability for uh, the EREFs and all of the modifications to the EREFs. And then when we looked at whether this should be scored as the worst area in the esophagus or whether we should look at the proximal and distal esophagus separately, actually scoring based on the worst area was the most reliable. Of course, the responsiveness again uh, was evaluated here. So we looked at all of these different modifications as well as a number of different methods for scoring it. Um, and, um, as per sort of the original hypothesis, the expanded EREFs did show the, uh, at least numerically, the greatest responsiveness. Although, again, the original EREFs here also very responsive uh, to therapy. So um, we looked at whether we should sum the scores from proximal and distal, whether we should look at individual subscores. Um, really, I think the takeaway here was that when you scored either the original or the expanded EREFs using the worst features of the disease, uh, that provided the greatest reliability and responsiveness uh, for a clinical trial setting. Um, so that's uh, summarized on this slide. Uh, really, I think, again, um, 
the score itself has uh, really high face validity and um, we've shown a number of the operating properties in, in the studies that we've done here. Um, so what does it all mean? It, just one last slide. This is some from the Corio's exercise. Uh, I think if you look at what the outcome domains were that were voted critical for inclusion, you see histopathology, endoscopy, and patient reported outcomes are all there. For histopath, we've made a number of recommendations around uh, thresholds for uh, remission definitions using the peak eosinophil count as well as the EOEHSS in clinical trial settings. Uh, for endoscopy, we've made some recommendations around using the EREFs and uh, scoring criteria for that as well. So um, with that, I just want to thank everyone for their attention. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with uh, the speakers who are here with us today and, and with all of the collaborators in the EOE space um, and very much looking forward to the discussion period. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. That was very clear and relevant. And I will now proceed to a discussion with the panel. So if you have questions for the panel, please enter these in the appropriate box in the screen and I'll bring it forward. And I'll try to discuss as many questions as possible with the panel, but if we can't um, respond to the question now, it will be answered uh, offline by email. And um, um, we heard from uh, the presentations from Katja and Chris that there is a dissociation between objective measures and uh, symptoms. So, um, uh, Chris, I'll, I'll just start with you. Uh, what does that mean clinically, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think from a clinical perspective, it, you know, I think there's been a number of practice surveys around what gastroenterologists do after they start treatment, whether they go based on symptom assessment alone, whether they go repeat scopes, whether they repeat the biopsies, what they target. And I think at least in Canada, and, and uh, maybe Evan can speak to sort of the broader landscape, there's a really wide heterogeneity in terms of what people do. Um, certainly, there's some practical limitations. How often can you bring patients back for endoscopy? How, how practical is that if you're doing a treatment regimen that involves multiple adjustments like diet uh, manipulation? Um, that being said, I think, for, I think it does highlight increasingly that potentially the treatment target of, of symptomatic remission alone is not sufficient. To date, I don't, we've not really had a, a treatment target or treatment practice-based design RCT, um, but I think that is certainly on the frontier of what, uh, what needs to happen moving forwards. Yes, uh I would I would agree with that, and I think you know the issue. And in, in, you know Katya spoke to it specifically. Number one, if you have a patient who's been dilated, you basically can't monitor their symptoms anymore, um, and they, they they should understand that too because they'll feel great, and you have no idea what's going on sort of under underneath in the esophagus. Um, but the second thing is is you know, when we think about you know, monitoring EOE, symptoms are part of it. And of course you want the patients to feel better, but we also need to see what's going on endoscopically. How does the esophagus look and what's going on with the biopsies? And so I think at this point, it's not enough just to monitor symptoms and patients can probably understand that. And, you know, I think it's a big question of how frequently you may need an endoscopy. That's a whole other discussion um, and people are, are working on thinking about that, but you do have to monitor people long-term and periodically they'll need an endoscopy to assess what's going on. And certainly after treatment changes and to assess treatment effects, they'll need an endoscopy. Yeah, and Katja, there's a question for you. Do you think it, it would help if people would use these more structured ways of, of doing history using maybe PROs in clinical practice or is there any evidence for that? You know, we don't have an evidence, uh, but we have some centers that actually, I think my clinic uses ESI, so um, in clinical care. And whether that's helpful, I don't know, but maybe Evan can also speak because Evan developed the visual analog scale that's very simple, zero to 10. That's a bit less involved in terms of, for example, programming an instrument like ESI, which at the moment takes a bit of time to program. Um, and so I, you know, I'm not sure at this point, we don't have studies to show that these instruments have validity like in clinical care. And actually, you know, we are working to get these studies done, but I think some simpler instruments could certainly be done. And I think as, as I said, I think as we go forward and our phone, you know, our 
home technology is getting incredible. I'm sure in five years from now, there will be all these apps that patients could just come in, fill out before they go see you guys. And then eventually it might translate and influence your treatment decisions. They're probably not there yet, but I, I see a bright future assuming how incredible our phones are these days. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. I think very few people use these, these validated PROs in practice. They tend to be much more research tools and tools for clinical trials. But there are data in some other fields that applying PROs in routine care actually does help improve outcomes and help patient care. And I mean, I think we like tracking things over time. We track the objective measures. And I think we should track symptom measures as well. And if we can get these integrated, it seems theoretically possible, right, to integrate these into our electronic medical records and have them filled out. Um, the technology is probably there. So it would be nice to start doing that. Yeah. So, so but for the moment, we're, we still got stuck with, with endoscopy and biopsies. Mm -hmm. And um, although we're, as gastroenterologists, um, enjoy this and um, um, earn our salaries with endoscopy, it is um, often logistically challenging to uh, schedule multiple endoscopies and um, also for the patient, uh, it's a huge burden. What do you think of the less invasive tests such as the string test? So the, the string test for, for people who are watching who may not know this is a technology where you, uh, a patient would swallow a capsule attached to a string. The capsule dissolves and the string dwells in the esophagus for about an hour. The string is removed. While it's dwelling in the esophagus, it absorbs a number of inflammatory factors related to eosinophil granules or other inflammatory cytokines and proteins. And this was led and developed by uh, Glenn Feruda and Steve Ackerman and, uh, and then tested in a multi center group. And, and the, these factors that the string absorbs quite closely correlate with the eosinophil counts on biopsy. And so the idea is to use this as a monitoring technique to potentially replace endoscopy in patients who don't have strictures or don't need dilation, where you could have them swallow a string and then and follow, follow this um, over time. And I think the concept is very, very promising. I think it is just being... Um, rolled out into certain clinical venues now. And I don't know if any of you guys have direct experience with it yet. We have here at UNC, we don't have experience with that yet. It's just a, in a very limited um, rollout. But I think it has the potential to really improve the way monitoring works and make it um, a, bit, a bit easier for patients. And similarly, there's cytos, uh, cytos sponge technology, similar concept, a, a capsule um, is swallowed. It, it deploys into a sponge that you then pull out and it grabs a piece of tissue and you can assess eosinophil counts on that. So I think those are up and coming um, and we've been talking about them for a number of years, but they are both now released and, and starting to come into practice. Yeah, so and, and we talked about, um, the speakers talked about the EUE HSS scoring system for, um, uh, for reviewing histology in, in clinical trials. Is this, um, also something for clinical practice, uh, Chris? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Um, certainly if you look at the component items within the EOEHSS, um, it takes a longer time to assess than, than counting the peak eosinophils alone. Um, for that reason, um, you know, it was really a recommendation from Corios that it's right now being used in, in RCTs. Um, there are some components of the, the EOEHSS which may not always be adequately sampled, um, especially if you're taking a couple of superficial biopsies. So the, a good example is the lamina propria fibrosis. If, I think in clinical practice right now, it, it probably hasn't been widely used yet. Um, that being said, you know, one of the things that we're working on is whether a simplified version of the EOEHSS that still captures this um, or still has the same reliability and responsiveness characteristics can be developed that would be simpler for adoption in, in routine clinical practice. But the short answer is, I think at the moment, I don't think any, many centers are using it in their routine day-to-day -day care, um, and it'll take some time to, to percolate through. Okay, thank you. And if, a final question here for um, Karcha, because we're running out of time. The, most PROs uh, have been um, developed in English, Karcha but they're now used in, in different uh, cultures and different languages. Is, is that a problem? Do you think it's a problem? 
So I think, let's say, like, for example, I mean, you, you, you have used these, I've always think you've seen it in Dutch. And I think European languages, like, for example, I compare it now to German, like, I, I, between European languages, I'm able to look at German, French, and English, and I don't see many differences. I mean, in terms of language that is seen, it's very similar. And I, I wonder if you have the same experience, if you look at Isai and have persons also talking in Dutch. So it'd be actually great to hear you, your thoughts. Maybe as we go through languages that are non-European, there we might have to do more work, qualitative work to try to reassess if these tools are appropriate for, for non-European languages. You know, I think that's um, conceptually something we have to think about. So, you know, if we have to use it in Japanese or something, I'm sure it's not going to be entirely helpful. And then you need to go do a cross-cultural validation and do validation uh -huh. studies. And it would not be as simple as, as translation and simply seeing that the usability is the same. Yeah, so well, some, some cultures, uh, some cultures such as uh, in China, they, they use different words or don't recognize certain symptoms such as heartburn or dyspepsia is very different in, in Chinese or it may all be the same word. So um, I'm curious how that will go with um, the EOE PROs. Um, we've, we've come to the end of uh, this webcast and um, uh, I think there are a few uh, closing remarks from um, Chris. So uh, thank you very much, Arian. I uh, just wanted to, again, uh, on behalf of the Elementif team, I wanted to thank uh, Evan, Katja, Arian for, for your time today and, and to thank everyone who was able to join the webcast. Um, we'll get to all of the questions um, that weren't answered uh, live uh, by email. And um, I think hopefully you've seen it's a, a very exciting space, uh, rapidly changing, and uh, we very much appreciate your time today. So thank you very much.